And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Odenkirk. You have to go all the way around. Here he is. Hey, Bob. Thank you. Bob Odenkirk. All right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. So the, uh, Bob, hi. Hey, buddy. How's so, it going? Uh, it's going good. Remember um, the sketch we did? That, the blackout sketch? Where, uh, what can't was, read? What was it? Yeah. What, Do you remember that? Yes. What the hell? It was bad. It was not well, good. But we, we did it because it was bad. Yeah. And we loved how bad it was. It was your idea. It wasn't yeah. my idea. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell it if I, but tell them it's terrible, it's but you have to know that in the second city show we did together, this we did a blackout. And how come we didn't just come up with 10 and do just do different one every night? Yeah. this isn't it's not good, <laughs> it's just the worst dumb joke. Yeah, but it was so fun to make the audience hope for something good, <laughs> and we let them down to every mislead night. Them, you know, with a couple good sketches yeah. before that. Yeah. And then, oh, this will be good, they thought, as we started. <laughs> All right. Well, here was the blackout. <laughs> the, and Bob came to me with this idea, and I was like, oh, I don't know. And he goes, oh, so the scene will start, and it'll, you'll be, oh, I'll, you'll, I'll hand you something and say, I read it. And then you start pretending like you can't read. <laughs> and so the blackout I, was basically me going like, he hands me something, and he goes, read, read that out loud. And I'm like, <laughs> and he goes, oh my God, you can't read. You can't read. Do you remember that? No, kind this of. Is, okay, and, and he goes, going. There's you more can't to it. read. And then I, I go, all right, fine, shut up. And then I throw the thing down. And then he, gets, he walks out of the scene, and he, but he, he goes down like this, and he starts crawling out of the scene. And I go, <laughs> you can't walk. You can't walk. <laughs> Everybody is insulted afterwards. <laughs> yes. And not just, you know, their, in, their intelligence is insulted. It insults the whole audience, the performers who are doing it, mm -hmm. degrade themselves. Well, I just want to say that it wasn't my idea. <laughs> and but I want I to was say it was player. my idea. I was a team player and, and I did it. there's some part of me that delights in something that's just not going to work out. <laughs> and that's why I like to sing in sketches and things. Yeah. Because it's not going to be good. And I'm going to do my best. Mm -hmm. They have me sing in Better Call Saul a lot, a fair amount. Yeah. And because they, they know I love doing it. Because I can't sing at all. But you don't sing to, you don't find it funny. Though. I don't know what it is, Tim. It's something about this is so not going to work. And the audience, I guess I assume that the audience will think the same thing we thought. At some point in the process, they'll go, they know this is terrible. And they're making me watch it. And they'll somehow be happy about that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's a John Waters type thing. Uh, you know, like, this isn't going to be good, but I'm going to put it on film and cut it together. And... You're gonna make go everybody see it. uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm talking about his earlier work. Mm. Yeah. Which I believe I saw some here. I believe I might have seen Pink Flamingos here. Yeah, this is a great theater. Yeah. I saw Blue Velvet, I think, here back in the day. Nice. Yeah. Should we just name a bunch of old films we saw? Yeah. Keep doing that. I saw. No. Um, well, let's talk about the book. Should we, or should we just... Yeah, it took forever to write this thing, so please, let's talk about it. And so, what made you decide to write a memoir, first of all? What made you think that anybody cared? Uh, I told Bob before we were having dinner, I said, I'm going to be really ang mean on stage, so be prepared. I attack. A uh, couple things happened. One, I read a biography by uh, a character actor who was in quite a few big productions on Broadway and in film. 
and somebody whose work I enjoyed. Uh, and I love showbiz memoirs. I, I kind of read, I've read two. Van, <laughs> no, I've read two Van Halen <laughs> memoirs. Two. Two Van Halen biographies? Well, memoirs, you know, pieces ab about them, about the band. Yeah. Okay, by who in Van Halen? One was uh, by, well, David Lee Roths, and the other was um, a, a record executive who <laughs> wrote about the band and, okay. and his time, you know, helping the band to uh, do whatever the fuck they did. I don't know. <laughs> not a big, uh, uh, you're not a but big. But my point is I love showbiz memoirs. And uh, so I don't have, you know, I just like reading them. So I th thought, you know, I could write one maybe because I've done a lot of stuff. But also my assistant in the third season of Better Call Saul was a, a, a woman named Melissa Hyman, who's an improv actress uh, from uh, Albuquerque. And I had a, a box of pictures um, that I was taking out of my as I was unpacking for the season to start the season. And I started showing her pictures of us backstage at Second City and Dell and um, different shows, Saturday Night Live, me and Smigel and Conan O'Brien and Greg Daniels just at SNL. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, fuck, there's some stories in here that people like her would love to hear you tell. And, um, and then about a year later after that, I, I was the same person, Melissa, was telling me that she auditioned at UCB and she was one of 500 people who auditioned for improv teams. And I was like, fucking hey, 500 people? She goes, yeah, in New York it was 1,000. And I was like, holy shit. Well, there's a lot of young people who maybe would be interested. And um, then I, the way the book is structured, came to me very quickly and it, it sort of made sense to me that I had had this interaction with Del Close. Does clap if you know who Del Close is. <laughs> Maybe a little over half the audience. Del was a director at Second City and a teacher. Um, and when I ran into him on, on Wells Street when I was in college, he, was, he had just quit Second City the day before it was the fifth time he quit, but um, it was actually, it was, still wasn't for good. He came back and did He came back and did a show, yeah. But it, it was for a long time, and then he, he started in, uh, creating the I.O. within the next two years. And, uh, he, yeah, and he, uh, um, he, I said, could I interview you? And he talked to me, and I, I talk a lot about this in the book, and he talked to me for about two hours, and it was an inspiration to me to hear him ramble about his career. And I thought that inspired me so much, that interaction. Maybe I could do the same thing for some young people. You know, the business is such a strange thing to enter into if you're from Naperville, where I'm from, um, or anywhere in the Midwest where you're not, or you have no one in your family who's an actor or writer or anything. You know, a lot of things are a mystery, but that this business is a particular mystery. It's such a made-up thing. Everything we do is just invented. And um, so, I don't know, Dell talking and rambling through his career to me that day made me feel like it was a, it was a realistic thing filled with, in, you know, um, experiences that were intriguing some of them I'd heard of and knew about. He had, he had been an acting coach at Saturday Night Live and, of course, Second City I knew, and he directed there for years and taught. And some of them I'd never heard of. He was talking about off-Broadway show with Larry Hagman, the nervous set. He was talking about working with uh, this traveling horror show movie thing. He was talking about um, working with Elaine May, um, he was ranging all over this crazy career, Get Smart, uh, the committee, the work that they were doing there in San Francisco. And I didn't know, of course, I'd never heard of the committee. I'd never heard of Elaine May. A lot of these things I didn't know the reference, but it, it was still, in it, I still walked out of there going, I've got to try this. That sounds exciting to me. And I also said uh, to Dave Pasquese, who's here tonight, 
one of my cast members, castmates from Second City, and a, maybe the great greatest improviser in this room, I bet. I'll put money on that. Um, and I was just telling him, the other thing was, um, he, he made it seem possible, but I'd never, at, at the time, Dell was 49, but he looked like he was 70. <laughs> But I'd never met an older person who was excited about what they were going to do next. <laughs> like, who, he talked to me about the show. He was going to start doing a cross currents with two other uh, performers, and they were going to improvise and write and maybe do monologues mixed with sketches and use the newspaper and bring it to life. And, and I just, I remember looking at him as he's telling me this and thinking, this, I've never seen anybody his age tell me what they were going to do in a way that was sounded like it might be cool or great or that they were excited about it. Every older person I knew was trying to uh, play more golf <laughs> or, get, I don't know, get drunk as quickly as they could, as soon and... And that's it. And, and, and so there, were, there was something about his excitement, and I just thought maybe I could borrow that uh, interaction and build on it to, uh, to write a book. And uh, so this you, is why I wrote it. You did. It's great. I mean, uh, and... Oh, by the way, it ends before the movie Nobody comes out and before my heart attack because it was supposed to be out a year ago but uh, the pandemic uh, made us delay shooting the final se season of Better Call Saul, and then that took for fucking ever. It's gonna be great, but it took for fucking ever. I can't wait for you to see it. I can't wait for you to see it. But uh, everything got very delayed. Mm -hmm. But I also like that it came, it's, it finishes before that movie comes out, because that movie, is such an uncertain endeavor. I mean, it really is a crazy roll of the dice that took so much work on my part and, and sacrifice to make, even though the chances of it fucking up everything and being not good are probably pretty high. But the, so I, that's where I'm at when I wrote this book. Right. I don't know if it's gonna play for people. All I know is we killed ourselves to make it. It took me years to get it made. I had to suffer my wife's scowl every time I walked out of the house because she didn't want me to make an action movie. And uh, she's proud of it now. But uh, she doesn't like action movies. Violence, very upsetting to her. And uh, so... Well, I think I speak for, you know, probably most of America, like when I saw that it was happening, I was like, what the fuck? Because <laughs> you, uh, you know, I've known you for a long time. You are the, I've never even seen you do something athletic <laughs> in all the time I've known you. So when I saw the scenes of you fighting, I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> And I was so excited about people like you, Tim, yeah. old friends. Yeah. And I wanted, and I right away I knew when I pitched the story to some writers, and we went through two teams of writers before we got to Derek, who I'm so glad wanted to write it. Um, not ironic. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. No winking. There was at no the winking camera. at the audience. The character is not thinking it's funny mm -hmm. that he's doing this. I really wanted to risk everything yeah. and, and say, you know, look, it's either going to be the hugest mistake I ever made mm -hmm. or uh, it might work out. Yeah. But the one thing that I would say bridges what, how you know me and that movie is Better Call Saul and the character I play in that movie. And this was my pitch when I went out to pitch it is forget the comedy I've done because... Most people have never seen it. <laughs> and, but in Better Call Saul, which plays around the world, it's an earnest guy. He can be very funny, but there's a lot of scenes where he is laying his heart bare and he's getting pushed down, pushed down, pushed down, and he never quits. Mm -hmm. 
and that's an action lead, except there's no fighting. Right. But otherwise, all that stuff I'm playing and that's connecting with people mm -hmm. uh, and who don't know Mr. Show and don't know the comedy I've done, mm -hmm. that's how they know me. Yeah. So for them, the only addition is the fighting. Right. And uh, so- That's a big addition though. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, and I'm not saying it's like in a bad, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side, I'm a fan, so don't, you know. But yeah, but it was like, it was surprising. To see. And you did it, it you did it, you, you pulled it off. It wasn't, as the movie went on, it wasn't like, oh, this is impossible that this guy could be doing this. And like, I bought into it and I, I know how thin you are. <laughs> how thin you are. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, well, but it was great to you see. You should meet the guy who taught me how to do knife fighting. He's smaller than me and he'll... Yeah. He'll cut you? He'll take you down. <laughs> yeah, any guy with a knife can basically he trains can beat me. Seals. I will lose to anybody with a knife. I'll just say that right out. You know. I don't know. He actually, the, one of his major points is it's really hard to kill someone with a knife. Oh, really? Yeah. What about stabbing him in the heart? A lot. How about stabbing him 30 times in the heart? I that mean, will do it? Yeah, you, you can't just... So listen, this is what easy. we want you guys to know. <laughs> to kill someone, you have to stab him 30 times in the heart, all right? Um, Quote Bob Odenkirk. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually not easy. Um, but so, so it ends before that movie comes out and And so I thought that's what I was thinking that the book was maybe a reaction to No, no, no. Stuff. That's I, great. Uh, yeah, and uh, I should add in that Ben Greenberg, uh, my editor, called me uh, to say, do you want to write a memoir? Mm -hmm. So I had these thoughts and these experiences where I thought there's some stories to share with people. And then out of the blue, he called me and said, have you ever thought about writing a memoir? Right. And so I, I also think some of the, a lot of the comedy that I've done, in order for people to have a, a sense of it, I'd have to write this sooner than later because there's so much pop culture nowadays. Uh, everything gets covered over with another 100 pounds of right. humor or whatever right. uh, every day. Yeah. So yeah. I had to get to it. Well, I'm glad you did. Let's talk about some of the early stuff. Sure. Do you mind? I don't, yeah. Like, this is the other thing is that we didn't even talk about any of this. We should have been better prepared, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so I didn't know if you wanted to cover things in the book or if you wanted to just talk about things no, outside. Of anything. The anything, anything. Uh, okay. Well, one of the things that I found interesting uh, was uh, about, you, about growing up, you growing up. And like we'd have had conversations over the years where we talked about our parents or whatever, but it's always very short. Uh, and I was very surprised by the relationship you had with your father and how you talked about it in the book. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I thought about too was that a lot of people in comedy mm -hmm. come from, including myself, uh, backgrounds where when you're going through it, you don't realize how dark or uh, unhealthy it is, and you don't learn that until you look back on it. So my question is, what was the, ex what, is, what is your sort of experience, you can relate it to, you know, your, your relationship with your father, and how maybe it changed you, I'm just speaking for myself too, as a, the way I'm a father to my kids, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I think I wanted to not be my dad, <laughs> the opposite right. of my dad, which is what every generation does, right? <laughs> like, just, I'm going to give my kids the exact opposite, and then they go too far in that other direction. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, you know, I, I think my dad, um, which I talk about in the book, uh, grew up in the Chicago area. Well, that's part of his childhood was in... Louisiana, um, uh, and he was a salesman who did business forms and had an office, I believe, in West Chicago, and he had one in Hinsdale, kind of moved around a lot. He was actually skilled at what he did, something that you can do on a computer nowadays at home. But back then, if you wanted to make a form for a hospital or a big company, um, they would say, we need these area, it's the most boring thing ever. 
that we need but it to look up, like this. But listen up, just listen. Listen closely. Uh, and you'll be so thankful for computers again. I'm so glad none of those jobs exist. No one has to do that shit. Um, but he was really good, and it took a lot of skill. And uh, uh, if he hadn't been a drinker and a sloppy person as a person, I mean, he was just kind of irresponsible guy. And uh, kind of immature, and, um, and he wasn't around much. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so, I mean, it's all about, as a dad, I just wanted to be there for my kids. Um, as the second oldest of seven, I had little kids around me, and I loved them, and I thought they were awesome. Mm -hmm. And I uh, knew I wanted to have kids in my life, and, and I wanted to be there for them and give them attention and, and laugh and be with them because they're funny as hell. It's the funnest thing ever. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it would be that. It would just be to, to be the opposite of my own father. And do, when you were younger, I know I did, was uh, I, try, I became more entertaining for my mother and for my brothers and sisters. And, like, I learned, like, just even... How many kids? In I had youngest of six. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. I'm seven. Yeah. Second oldest. <laughs> And it's funny, Colbert, I was on Colbert the other day, and he's 11. He's the youngest of 11. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well... The more kids, the funnier you, know, honestly, you are. Honestly, I didn't feel like... <laughs> I didn't feel like... I didn't feel like I had to do it at all. I, I just... Yeah. I think, you know, comedy is a I lot of like, things. I don't feel like I had to do it either. I think I naturally did it because I just wanted to, like, elevate the what was going on the in the energy. house. You know yeah. what I mean? I wasn't, I don't think yeah. it was a conscious effort. And I think that's what I did too. And yeah. that's what really all the kids in our family did. But yeah. I definitely did. And my brother, Bill, who's a writer, yeah. wrote for The Simpsons for years. And now he and I are on a project together. Um, uh, yeah, it was really about it. it. We all made each other laugh and yeah. goofed around a lot, laughed and were very silly. Belly and, laughs. Yeah, and, and silly, silly, silly. Yeah. And because this thing that's around you, this energy that's around you is so uncomfortable and you can't do anything about it. You can't solve the problems of the family. Right. You don't even really know what they are. There's like something going on, but you don't know what it is. Yeah. My dad would come to us every couple months and tell us that we were going to go broke in a day or two. Mm. Yeah, in the book and, you tell the story. And I tell the story of when I was five and my brother was six, and we were in our new house. We had bought a new house, yeah. and we were in our new bedroom with new beds and new desks, and he called us in. I got to talk to you. And I remember standing there, and there was, I'm looking at my new desk and new bed, and it's really great. Mm -hmm. And he says, we're almost out of money. <laughs> we're, we're real close. I don't know what we're going to do. I, I don't know what we're He's a five and a six-year-old. I don't know what we're going to do. What do you I guys mean, think we should do? I don't you... know. Build a fort? Maybe we can eat hot dogs, Dad? I don't know. Hot dogs aren't that expensive, are yeah. they, Dad? We can eat cheaper. Uh, so there was that weirdness yeah. and that existential fear. And as a kid, you just... What do you do with that? Well, There's also, not a you don't know. Thing to do with it. You don't know any different either. I mean, it's all you right. know. That's so you, you are just sort of adjusting to like make it through like whatever it is that you, you know, you're dealing with. Like, my, it's, it's funny because a good friend of mine, Steve Meisner, I had a, a lot of friends who were into comedy in Naperville, and Steve was one. And his life was even more horrendous because his dad would like really fuck him up like he would give him lectures that were insane and mm -hmm. and when he he talks about the first time he saw Monty Python mm -hmm. and it was like seeing God yeah. Yeah. I mean he's like he was at a he remembers where he was uh it was his sister's friend's house and this show comes on and this show is a bunch of adults of course, those guys were all like 20-something. But to, to an 11-year-old, that's an adult. And they're being super silly. And, and I said, well, what, what is it 
I asked him, I, I think it's in the book. I said, what, what did that do for you? Because he was like, I'm telling you, the whole world changed. Mm -hmm. He goes, it just was a bunch of adults, and they were telling me that life is fucking ridiculous. Yeah. And that all these adults that are yelling at you and making rules and, and torturing you are stupid. They're, they're ludicrous, and it's dumb. And we're adults, and we agree, and we know it's true, and we're telling you it's true with this show. And, uh, and it was comforting, unbelievably comforting to go, oh, all that stuff that I've been afraid of, and these adults, they're unhinged, but I think they, know what they're, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. They're just dumb. <laughs> and uh, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. 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 Um, I was never into that. Preston Sturge's thing of uh, is Sullivan's Travels. Yeah. That'll uh, be showing here I, next week, by the way. <laughs> it's a famous movie, and it's kind of really about what I just said. But I kind of, when I heard it, I, it made me mad. I didn't like the movie. I, it was too soft for me. Mm. But it's, I think he's right. I think he's absolutely right now. I mm. think I've done enough stuff now to see that Maybe the greatest value of anything we do in a drama or comedy is just make people feel connected and, and, and feel like that's those feelings that I'm watching on screen, that sensibility is either is I'm not alone because mm -hmm. somebody else clearly feels that way and mm -hmm. they're showing me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so I, I think I've changed my mind on that. I don't know why I hated it so much when I first saw it. I don't either. It. Why did you hate it? I was like, fuck you. That's Pablum. <laughs> but I think he's dead right. No, oh, I felt that way about uh, uh, Modern Family for a long time. <laughs> I did. I was like, this is like, everybody on this show is way too smart and witty. Even the kids are witty and... And then I realized, oh, it's a TV show, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, it's written by writers. It should, the kids should be funny or I wouldn't fucking care about it, you know? <laughs> um, but let's, let's jump up to, uh, let's go, can we, do you mind if we just keep moving yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, keep going. So let's talk about, uh, you, you, okay, so you, you, you got into comedy, you started doing some stand-up, but you didn't feel really it was your thing at that time. Yeah, I never, well, I never did. I mean, I love Steve Martin's stand-up. Right. Because, like, I, in my estimation, his stand-up was kind of like a sketch version of stand-up. Yeah. It was like conceptualized yeah. stand-up. So I love that. There's something about sketch that I love. Um, and but but you know you and I both have good friends who love stand up like you know it's their religion right they're great and so we know lots of people like that and that's never was me and uh, I, I guess I feel like stand up feels more limited to me um, and you know the first challenge with a stand up act and I did a lot of stand up in the Chicago area because the stand up boom happened when I was. 21 around there and there were all these clubs there were no club you know there was like four clubs three four and then there were 14 within like a year and then not only that like every bar had yeah. a comedy night yeah so you could make 20 bucks 20 bucks you know every night right. maybe 40 do two of them right and uh and i could get booked as the opener mm -hmm. at, at an all weekend club and and so I could write some jokes and waste 15 minutes of the audience's time. Mm -hmm. And uh, fuck yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I could never hone my voice, yeah. which is, I think, the first thing you got to either naturally do or find your way to. Right. And I just couldn't do it. Like I wanted, you, it's, it's harder when you're doing conceptual stuff also. Yeah, yeah. It's harder to get the audience to know who you really are because you never really are being yourself. You're always just doing you know, different... Well, ideas. I would mix it up. Mm -hmm. I would, like, talk about some thing in the real world that annoyed me or whatever. Then I would do a joke that was totally conceptual, like Stephen Wright-ish. And then I would do a character voice and just 
ramble in a character voice, and it's just a mess. It's like, <laughs> pick one thing yeah. and go there and stay there. Yeah. Because that's what stand-up is. Yeah. And um, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, well, but you eventually took those things that you learned and started doing one-man shows. Well, that was kind of a thought I had, because I like Bob Newhart, and I recognize that he did sort of what I liked. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bob Newhart um, comedy album. But his, his comedy albums are little sketches that he monologues through. And, you know, they're very written. And uh, some of them could be played as a sketch, I think. Uh, and so it was very interesting. He was very different from everybody else. I'm not really sure if anyone did anything act like him. I don't think so. So it was a very unique act. Yeah. And I, I like that. And I also saw Eric Bogosian at the ETC Theater. Do you know who Eric Bogosian is? And he did a one-man show called Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll that was um, solo pieces. It was just him on stage, the whole show. And he's doing characters that are kind of interconnected. And... Um, and I thought there's something in between Bob Newhart and Eric Bogosian that I would like to do. So it's, I'm alone on stage. It's more actorly than Bob Newhart, who just talks. But it's kind of like Newhart. It's dry. It, it exists for comedy's sake. Eric's stuff was funny, but it was at theater, uh, meant to be kind of more, more about more, uh, have more depth or more sensitive characterization. Mine was like, let's be funny, find a joke, and then just beat the shit out of it <laughs> till everyone's sick of it. And uh, so yeah, that's what I did. I did yeah. that show at the ETC, and Joyce Sloan let me use the ETC theater for the summer, which is crazy, because I wasn't a Second City person. I hadn't gone up through the ranks. I, I don't even know how she knew who I was, but Tom Giannis directed it. And yeah. so Tom was had a relationship over there at Second City. Right. So he got us in there. But that was my show that was like Newhart and mm -hmm. Bogosian. Yeah. It was really fun too, man. Well, thanks. Um, it was called Half My Face is a is Clown. A, yeah. And the picture was Half My Face Painted as a Clown. Um, so if you like that, you would like the show. And there was... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was nothing in the show about your face being painted half no, clown. No, but <laughs> Just using that image and calling the show Half My Face is a Clown, I think tells everybody that it's going to be absurd, <laughs> super dry, and that's, you better be expecting that. Yeah, that's all that's going to happen. Uh, let's jump around. I'm sure... I want to talk about uh, Second City and stuff, um, and I mean, we both, like, you know, uh, worked with Farley mm -hmm. and got to know him, uh, and one of the things you talk I, about Tim, in the book... Tim, I was surprised at how much I wrote about Chris. You're surprised how much you did write? How much I did write. I it mean, obviously meant a lot it did. to you, man, yeah. and, and obviously, you know, Chris had an effect on... Uh, everybody that that worked with him and stuff, and especially because he left us too soon. Also, like the the story is sort of unfinished. You know what I mean? And so, like the things that we are sort of grabbing at and remembering are we we they're more precious now. You know what I'm you saying? You know, listen. Uh, there's two things that I think I can attribute to me having cared and thought and felt so much about Chris. One, my dad was an alcoholic, and when I finally understood what alcoholism was, my mom took me to uh, Al-Anon meetings when I was around 11 and 12, and that was really great. It was really great to hear a name for what was going on and to hear other people tell stories that, oh, that's like my dad. Okay, oh, that's what's happening. Um, but from that point on, from when I knew, I always had a part of me that was really tender about people with alcohol issues. When I was around them and I could sense it, I would almost start crying. Just, and I didn't even know them that well. I had a roommate right. in college and 
and he was an alcoholic at the you know in college mm -hmm. uh, and it really made me emotional just to be around him right um, so I always had that so when I got to know Chris and you didn't have to know him too long to understand what was happening right. on that side of the equation you know I, I was in that space when I was around him mm -hmm. but secondly um, Chris shared a lot of his soul with the audience immediately, all the time, right. and with everybody around him. Right. You did feel close to him very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was those two things. Like, you know, um, I, I said it on Stern the other day, and it really just came to me when I was talking to him. Because Howard was like, we didn't really get to know Chris. And I said, I, I think you did. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you saw him perform. A, even if you saw him in a few things, you, you, you knew that guy. You saw him, yeah. yeah. I, I would say the same thing to people, too, is that, like, he, he was, it wasn't much difference. His public persona and his private persona were pretty much the same. It was kind you know, a little bit more amped up in public. The Chris Farley show scene that yes. Smigel wrote on SNL. Yeah. Um, that was Chris. That's, that was an aspect of him. Yeah. The, the humility and like, because we used to give him shit about it because we used to say he was faking it when he would be like, um, what's it like being in the Beatles, Paul McCartney, you know? <laughs> And you'd be like, come on, man, don't, you don't have to act that way. Like, we're all adults. But he, he was genuinely, was like being like, wow, I can't believe I'm here, you know? But uh, I wanted, let's talk about... Uh, was it, did you read the part about Chris? Yes, yeah. Was it, what'd you think? I thought it was accurate. I mean, I, I think you were closer to him than I was. Yeah, I mean, I, if the stories that you tell in the book, we all have those stories where it's like, I don't know what else to do with you, you know? Um, and I had it too, where I was like, I love this dude, but I can't save him. I can't make him do what I want him to do because it's out of my control. Um, and it, it sort of hurt, you know? Yeah. But on the other side, let's talk about uh, Matt Foley. Yeah. Okay. Do uh, you guys know this sketch? Uh, it's a sketch, it was called The Motivational Speaker, and it was actually a character that Chris would do in improv sets with the cast, and we all loved it, but he could never really figure out what the character was. And then Bob... Well, I, we were improvising. It was, a, it was like an anti-drug speech that we were doing. I, mm -hmm. We were doing a faculty at a high school, mm -hmm. and I did a teacher or whatever. And it, it was based on a suggestion, I think, mm -hmm. Uh, and Chris did Matt Foley mm -hmm. as a coach. And, uh, well, I just went home that night, and, and I had been listening to the Tony Robbins cassettes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is an element of writing that character. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that was a new thing. Like, a motivational speaker was kind of a new thing people were talking about and learning about. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Tony Robbins... And I'm not going to get this right, so maybe somebody knows his shit better than I do, but didn't he say, like, I was a 300-pound kid when I was 14? Didn't he have something like that? Like, I was a mess. Yeah, like, that's his story. Like, and I remember that stuck in my head. Like, it was first hard to picture that he was a total mess at one point, yeah. but whatever. I'm sure he was, whatever. But just, I thought, what about a person who uses themselves as the negative example yeah but only but in the present yeah you want to be like me right now let you me know? tell you about my life right now right now yeah <laughs> and uh and then just another little detail but it all just popped into my head um i'm from naperville there's a dupage river and when i was a kid my mom would occasionally as a treat take us to burger king and we would go over the river, and the stoners from high school would hang out on the river uh, bridge. And I, I just had this image of the guy pulling up with his van there, and just, that's where he's going to live now. And, uh, and, and so all that came to my head. And Tim, uh, I've written thousands of sketches, mm -hmm. and probably 
six or eight of them were done the way I wrote them mm -hmm. the first time I wrote them. Right. Because everything needs to be fixed and rewritten right. always. But there's a few. Uh, Manson Lassie mm -hmm. on Ben Clap, Stiller's Clap, show. Um, the Great Falooza. Mm -hmm. Mr. Show. I mean, they stick in your head because, like, never happens. Yeah. And, and Matt Foley yeah. was what I wrote down on the legal From pad. From your head to the paper. Except for Smigel added breaking the table. Oh, on the show. On we SNL. couldn't do that. We couldn't do that at Second City. Right. But at Second City, it ended with Chris going, I'm going to go get my things. I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> and because uh, I'm sick of living in a van down by the river. And then he leaves and the dad goes, run, everybody hide. Yeah. Lock the door. <laughs> uh, my, one of my favorite lines in that sketch was when you would say, kids, I have a seat. I have a motivational speaker. Uh, it's going to come out here and talk to you. He's been down in the basement drinking coffee for the last four hours. <laughs> and I always felt that that line, especially on SNL, that it was sort of overlooked. Because when you brought the sketch to us, that was a really important note. Was that you have to know that he's been in the basement drinking coffee for four hours. And he's a little excited to get out here and perform for you. <laughs> was another line. And so we were all like, oh, this is going to be fun, you know. And you, you, we've talked about this before, but like literally the funniest thing I got to see every fucking night I know. was watching Farley do Motivational Speaker and sitting in a chair and watching him. We, it was so much fun. My daughter asked me what's the most fun you ever had in show business yeah. when she was like seven or eight years old. And I immediately said I did this sketch with this guy. Yeah. And every time he did it, every night was the most fun I've ever just, had in show business. <laughs> it was just nuts. Yeah. He used to whip his glasses, he would whip his, <laughs> and throw his glasses <laughs> to the side, like off stage. <laughs> he would grab me and pick me up because I was his son, and he's like, oh, we're going to be living together, me and you, buddy. <laughs> Fucking rolling me around in the, you know, in the air and... And it was just so, he sweat, he would sweat every night. <laughs> like, and you knew, he, he knows the sketch. He knows where it is in the running order. He knows what he has to do to get ready for it. But he would fucking give you 110% every fucking night, man. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And, and how about this, Tim? <laughs> that, that feeling, that feeling. I remember standing there, because I played the dad mm -hmm. at Second City. I remember standing there and thinking, as the sketch is going on, there's how many people sit in Second City? 300, something like that? 300 people went from, these are some funny young people, to mm -hmm. I love that guy for yep. the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. In, in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And they you did. just, yeah. you were there while that happened. Yeah. And you knew that everyone in that room was a Chris Farley fan yeah. for the rest of their lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we had a really great cast. We had a great show. And, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it was obvious to everybody that, you know, he was just he was the, the main dude. Well, we, I would love to keep jumping because you got such a long, you know, amazing career. Mr. Show, Gary Shandling Show, um, yeah. you know, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. So, it's all in the book. Yeah, it's all in the book, and you guys got it, I guess. But we're going to take some questions now okay. from the audience. So uh, I think we have people picked out, uh, or some great hands are going to go up or something. Who has a question for us? Back here. I have one right here in the front. I, I, yeah, they have a mic they're going to bring to you. We got one here. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Okay. Hi. I'll come back. Um, I'm curious about your relationship with Chicago. Uh, did you want to leave? Did you feel like you had to leave for your career? Would you ever come back? Well, I come back a lot because uh, my mom passed away a few months ago, but uh, she was I'm here sorry. and my two sisters still live here. And yeah, it was sad to say goodbye to her, but she had a great life. And uh, so I do come back um, and I will continue to. Um, and who knows, maybe even live here again. Uh, my wife loves coming here, and she comes here more often than I do to scout talent. Um, 
it was the weird thing is that I didn't feel like a Chicagoan when I left here <laughs> uh, when I was 25 to go write at Saturday Night Live. And over the years, even though, like when I was in New York, I'd go to every Bears game at a sports bar and um, I, I get the MLB app and I watch every Cubs game that I can, which is almost every one. Um, I just didn't feel like a Chicagoan when I left. I was like, I never understood that vibe, but maybe you do have to leave sometimes to feel that way. But over the years, I've seen and felt like, well, fuck yeah, I'm, I'm a Chicagoan for sure. Like, I don't know, it's meeting, I don't know, yeah. living in other cities, you know, and you, you, you go, that's where I'm from, that's how I see the world. Right. And I and I love that place. So yeah, I uh, I feel like I'm an adopted Chicagoan. Well, you're yeah. from Detroit. I'm from Detroit. So yeah. it's not. <laughs> it's in the sphere of influence. Yeah, we share a, the we, gravity. The whatever. Yeah, no, we hated each other in basketball. That's the only thing. <laughs> I, um, uh, we got. I'm gonna take one more question, and then we're gonna we have three more questions. But these are questions that Bob would like for you to ask him. So we're going to take one more question from someone with their own question. Yeah. It's me, Betsy Shepard. Hi, Bob and Hi. Tim. Oh, hey, yeah. Betsy. I like Bob. I've known Bob since the 80s. I'd like you to tell them, everybody, about the uh, comedy troupes you did with Conan and Smigel back in the day. And yeah. by the way, I texted Smigel a picture of you two, and he said, I said his name was mentioned, and Bob, he said, he's a fan. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so when I was in my first year at Saturday Night Live, uh, I wrote a lot with Robert Smigel. I really was, I think, hired to just help him and be his pal uh, because we'd worked together on the phone while he was there his first two years. And then Conan O'Brien and Greg Daniels got hired four shows after I got hired, and we all connected and we all, all write together. And then that season got abruptly ended by a writer's strike. So we had some sketches we hadn't gotten on the air because we weren't getting much on the air. And uh, we said, let's go to Chicago and do a show at Victory Gardens called Happy Happy Good Show. And, and in that show was the Bears fans, uh, the super fans. And uh, in the year 2000, and um, we did improv, an improvisational puppet troupe uh, with a Dell character. <laughs> and uh, it was very inside, uh, but it was fun to do. And it was a great, great silly show that ran all summer. And, uh, and they also had the nude beach sketch in it, which later went to SNL when Matthew Broderick was there. That's very cool. Um, I, I also, I'm gonna pass out questions. These you had a question. First. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. And do you are these in order? You want these in this uh, order? Yeah. Okay. So you come and ask this question. Um, I was going to say she needs two. a mic for sure. Yeah. I'll, can you come? Okay. I was going to say two before you ask your question. Uh, here's Hi, Bob. The, no, no. Hi. You got to read this question. You don't. You're not a asking questions. But hold on before you read I'm it. Not taking a chance on you asking me yeah. some crazy shit. Uh, before. <laughs> Before you, uh, I just want to see if you remember this, but when I got hired on the show at SNL, my first third show, my first sketch was Cyrano, the Cyrano sketch. And the joke of it was that I was Cyrano, but I had like a six inch wide nose. And uh, Alec Baldwin was Christian. And I had to uh, like teach him how to talk l the language of love to his girl. And so I was writing it. And I told you the idea on Tuesday night. And then you were like in my office and you go, oh yeah, you know what would be funny is if Cyrano talks like Barry White. <laughs> do you remember that? I do not. And, and I went, okay, yeah. And so I wrote that in, I gave you writer's credit on it and it was my first sketch on SNL. Wow. And, uh, and you, I, I, don't ever, I don't think I ever said like, fit, but thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe I did that. It's, well, a, um, it's great to hear. Yeah, it's like he, he was always been generous. And yeah, and, and I really appreciate well, you're that. You're welcome. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so first question. Let's hear it. This what, do you, what do you want to ask me? Anything. <laughs> Anything that's on that page. So I haven't read your book, and I don't... Say it louder, it. please. <laughs> Speak clearly. I haven't read your book, and I don't plan to, but I wanted to congratulate Hold on, take you. the mask down, just for the length of the question. I love you. You're doing great. And, and go slower. Third, third time's the charm. I haven't read your book, and I don't plan to, but I wanted to congratulate you on writing it and ask simply this. My favorite kind of writing is when someone overuses cliched terms and phrases or even just reuses words too often in close proximity. Does your book use this technique? <laughs> yes. Thank you for the question, yes. That is exactly the technique that I use in the book. All right, I need another question. Who has a question? Two, is you there come another here. question? I would love to have any other question. Do take your mask down and please project. Yeah. Question Use number mic, mic technique. two. Here we go. Here comes your mic. It's a short one, I think. Hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, you are wonderful. Um, <laughs> my question for you is, do you hate writing or yourself more? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an honest answer to that. Before my heart attack, I would have said myself. <laughs> but I definitely hate writing more. And I love writing, but I hate it more than myself. Because I think the heart attack made me think I'm very lucky and I should value this life that I have. That's great. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, one more question. One more question. Uh, the guy here with your hand up. Yes, you, T-shirt. Come on up here. Oh, I told you I can perfect. be it. Perfect. Take the mask down, project, and any question at all that you see on that page, you feel free to ask me. Hi, Bob. I'm a young person. I want to fail a Say lot. Say that again. I am a young person. Okay, I wait, want wait, to wait, fail. Wait, let's do it again. Slow down and speak clearly. <laughs> okay, okay, that's hard. Please. I am a young person. I want to fail a lot at my favorite thing to do. Will your book show me how to do that? If so, could you crystallize your approach to repetitive failure so I could just skim the book? Also, can you recommend a good book to read? Okay, so you like to fail a lot at the thing you like best in the world. Yes, my book will show you how to do that. It'll give you a, a very specific program. If you follow it, you can achieve that. Um, and can I recommend a good book to read? Kind of rude, but... Uh, Olga Tokarchuk, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. Great book. Great book. Olga Tokarczuk. I'm not kidding. Fucking amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Did you oh. want to... Um, All right. Bob, um, this is not his first time writing a book. He is another book that's called uh, Load of Hooey. Hey. And uh, would you like to preface yeah, I, this? Yeah, I, wanna, I just wanted to end with something meaningful. And there's a poem in here that I wrote uh, a few years ago that says a lot about who I am and uh, I thought I could read it to you to say goodnight to you tonight. I'll say thank you again for coming and for buying my book. I hope you enjoy it. Please share it with people around you. And while I'm told it's a quick read. While Bob is doing uh, Finding His Story. I'm told you it's a it? quick read, uh, my memoir. But that's good, because I want you to actually read the whole thing. And I want to thank my good friend Tim Meadows for hosting. Any, any excuse to see my friend Tim Meadows, I will take. I'll write a whole nother book just so I can sit and talk to this guy. The best. Okay. This is called <clears throat> A Meaningful Poem. Uh, the title of the poem is If I Had My Life to Live Over Again. If I had my life to live over again, 
I'd dare to make more mistakes. I'd risk more, go out on a limb. I'd take longer walks and feed the ducks in the park. I'd wear thicker socks and eat more ice cream. More ice cream and a better brand of ice cream <laughs> with a higher fat count. Gourmet ice cream. In fact, I would stick mostly to gelato. <laughs> I would notice every bird and give it a name, and I'd write that name in a tiny notebook. But let me return to the issue of ice cream. <laughs> I wouldn't confine myself to national brands. I would travel the countryside eating the regional equivalent of premium ice cream. <laughs> if I were eating ice cream with you, I would steal yours when you looked away. <laughs> if you never looked away, I would badger you through the entire feast. Are you going to finish that? I'll finish that if you don't, <laughs> until you gave in. For you see, I have been one of those people who eats an entire box of light ice cream with fewer calories, who orders three scoops of ice cream and says, make one of them sorbet, <laughs> who offers to share the death by chocolate dessert. I have even eaten an entire box of dietetic ice cream sandwiches in one sitting. What was I thinking? I should have just eaten the regular kind of ice cream sandwiches. I have even eaten popsicles when there was a haagen right nearby. I did that twice. Believe me, I remember. But if I had to do it all over again, I would eat even more, and I can't restate this enough, a higher fat count. In fact, Forget that shit I said about walking in the park and naming birds. <laughs> if I had my life to live over again, I would focus on the getting and eating of ice cream. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. I hope you like the book. Have a great evening. I'll see you again. Bob Odenkirk, Thanks. everybody. Let's hear it for Bob. <laughs>